I'm back, finally, with my IBM 5162 restoration and upgrade. Last time I tested this rather interesting 286 system out, along with a few ideas for upgrades, and played Wolfenstein 3D on it just in time for the game's 30th anniversary. This time around I'm going to upgrade the CPU, which is something that IBM really didn't want people to do, and I'll explain how and why as well as how we can work around that. <laughs> Now, as this whole thing needs cleaning, and I also need to do a fair bit of soldering, I need to remove the motherboard from the case. Interestingly enough, despite looks, this isn't actually a repurposed IBM 5150 case. There's an old story going around that these were only released to use up excess stock of those, but the 5162 case has had things shuffled around slightly to accommodate the extra expansion slots, as well as losing a few holes like the expansion cable hole and the cassette interface connector on the back. I always love finding stuff like this. There's a sticker on the bottom of the case showing a manufacturing date of October the 20th, 1987. To put that into perspective, 12 MHz 286 CPUs and indeed 386 CPUs had already been on the market for two years by that point, so the 5162 with its 6 MHz 286 really was a low spec machine for its time. Anyway, after a quick blast with some compressed air, we can get a proper look at the motherboard itself. So along the back edge we have the expansion slots, three of the 8-bit variety and five 16-bit, and unlike the 5170 PC-AT motherboard with its weird slot 8, all of these are fully functional. And by the 286 era ISA was standardised, and these were all backwards compatible with the 8-bit pre-ISA expansion slots in that original 5150 PC from 1981. By the keyboard and AT power connectors we have the RAM, which comes in the form of two 30-pin SIMs giving the first 512k and an additional 128k in the form of DIP chips on the motherboard itself, bringing us to our total of 640k. SIM compatibility is severely limited and can't be upgraded to a higher capacity or anything like that, so presumably they were used as a space-saving measure. But they can be swapped like for like for faster chips, which we may need to do to be able to upgrade the CPU past a certain point as this motherboard uses zero weight states. For compatibility with some older software, the motherboard RAM can be disabled by means of a jumper, which could presumably be wired to an external switch if switching it on and off regularly was a requirement. Next to those we have the BIOS, and this is where we run into our first issue with the upgrade. You see, by the time this system was released IBM were wise to early overclocking devices like the PC Sprint, which I've covered previously on the channel, and so they added some timing checks as part of the BIOS code which would freeze up the machine and cause it to fail to boot if the system clock had been tampered with. So, in short, we'll more than likely need to replace the BIOS. And the reasoning behind this limitation is basically one of money. IBMs were expensive machines, and if an end user could extend the life of their system, that would seriously impact new PC sales. Also, with this 5162 being a lower end machine with a lot of upgrade potential, they didn't want people buying them and upgrading them over buying a much more expensive PC like the new PS2 series, which was typically around double the price. Anyway, back to the hardware. Next to the BIOS we have the AT keyboard controller and the Intel 8742 peripheral controller, and these are covered in some kind of horrible sticky residue. So let's get that cleaned up with our old friend Alcohol. The 8742 has some EEPROM memory on board, so I'll remove the original UV protective erase sticker and replace that with a nice new one. Beyond the sea of logic chips, which aren't particularly interesting in and of themselves, although I have to say the layout of this board is a thing to behold, we have a socket for the 287 coprocessor, which I'll be populating because, well, why not? And the 6MHz 286 CPU and its associated timing circuitry. From the factory, this consisted of a 12MHz crystal oscillator, which bizarrely enough, like the CPU, was actually socketed despite not being user upgradable, and an Intel 82284 clock driver, which took the frequency from the crystal and halved it, in this case giving us our 6MHz. This one's only good for up to 8MHz, as is the 82288 bus controller, so I'm going to socket both of these and fit their 12MHz capable CMOS based counterparts, which are a drop in replacement for the original slower HMOS chips. Desoldering, as always, is just a case of adding flux and some fresh solder, and then working my way around the pins using a vacuum desoldering station, and thankfully they all come out very cleanly, and after another good cleaning, the new sockets go in with no problems at all. This time around I decided to try using Kapton tape to hold them in place, and it seemed to work pretty well. I've replaced the original chips for now just to test everything is still working, and it seems that's all booting up fine. While I have the motherboard out and the desoldering station up and running, I'm also going to remove the tantalum capacitors. They're mostly the same value, 10 microfarads at 16 volts, apart from one labelled C66 which for whatever reason is 33 microfarads. These will be coming to the end of their life after 35 years and when they fail they tend to explode and cause a dead short, which can cause other problems. 
So while it's a fiddly and time consuming job, I think it's well worth doing as a preventative measure that should hopefully keep this thing ticking along for another 35 years. As you can see, IBM used three-legged tantalums as they made the manufacturing process far easier. Putting two-legged tants in backwards can be dangerous, but as they're very uncommon these days, I'll be replacing them with their modern two-legged counterparts. The centre hole is positive, with the two outers both being connected to ground, so bear that in mind if you don't want one going pop in your face. I don't have the replacements yet, but the board will run fine without them, so I'll replace those later on when they finally arrive. So now we get to the fun part. With everything socketed, I can easily swap components around and see what works. So I'll start by using Check It to benchmark the stock setup, which I'll also save so I can compare later on. By the way, I'm using a modern ATX power supply with an AT adapter cable for testing, as it should give much cleaner and more reliable power. And as it happens, the original doesn't actually boot without the load of the hard drive attached anyway. When I rebuild this, I may well upgrade the internals of that original PSU, but that's a project for a later video, as I already have enough on my plate for this one, as you'll see. The first upgrade I want to do is to fit a 287 coprocessor. To be honest, there isn't a huge amount of software that supports this, particularly on the game side of things, but there's an empty socket, so I may as well put something in there. This lovely gold i287XL supports clock speeds of up to 12.5MHz, which should be able to handle anything I can throw at it, as I'll be installing a 12MHz CPU in this machine. A quick check it benchmark shows that it's detected and working, and while it of course has no bearing on CPU performance, it has given us an enormous boost of nearly 10 times the performance on MAFS operations, generally used in early 3D stuff like CAD applications, flight simulators and the like. So now it's time to finally remove that old original 6 MHz CPU and those 82284 and 82288 chips and swap them for something with the potential to run up to twice as fast. These are all genuine Intel parts, the CPU just pops straight into the original socket so no problems there, and of course the other two chips go into the sockets that I added earlier. A quick benchmark at stock speed just to put it all through its paces, of course it won't be any faster yet but it's good to know that the new components are working ok. So finally the stage is set, and hopefully now we can increase the speed of the system clock and therefore the CPU just by swapping out the crystals. I decided to pick up a few different options, remember the frequency is halved by that 82284 clock driver, so I have 16, 20 and 24 MHz crystals here for clock speeds of 8, 10 and 12 MHz respectively. So let's swap out the original 12 MHz crystal for its 16 MHz counterpart and see what happens. Well, actually the answer is nothing. The system now refuses to boot and I think I have a pretty good idea why. Remember that anti-overclocking code in the BIOS I mentioned earlier? Thankfully, with 286 motherboards being relatively basic and other manufacturers being so close to IBM's design, it turns out the BIOSes are actually pretty universal and interchangeable, which confuses my late 90s early 2000s PC brain, but hey, it certainly seems to run just fine with this AMI BIOS installed. I'd rather not keep this longer term, as although it offers a lot more functionality, it's not original, and there is a way around the speed limiting code which I'll have a look into very soon. But for now this gets the 5162 up and running, and a benchmark shows that that 8MHz clock speed results in a very healthy 37% increase in performance. Of course benchmarks aren't everything, and as we know how Wolfenstein 3D ran on this machine before, I thought why not capture some footage and show them side by side. And I think that's pretty conclusive. I didn't want to capture a huge amount as the files are quite big, but playing it through the first few levels it seems everything's nice and stable with no obvious issues, and the adlib sound is working just fine at the higher clock speed too. So now we're into somewhat uncharted territory, as I can't really find much evidence of people successfully taking these machines above 8MHz. This time I'm installing a 20MHz crystal for a clock speed of 10MHz, putting it on par with IBM's high-end 286 PS2 machines of the era. The machine boots just fine, and the Check It benchmark shows a 71% improvement over the stock speed, which is a pretty huge upgrade, if it works. Unfortunately, although the benchmark is promising, Wolfenstein 3D just freezes up right at the title screen. I did discover that removing the adlib card allowed the game to get much further, getting halfway through level 1 each time before freezing, so that's quite interesting. I wasn't sure if this might be heat related, as the CPU seemed very hot to the touch, and while active cooling wasn't really a thing on 286 machines, I thought I'd at least humour myself and probe some things and see what the situation was. As it happens, under load the CPU is peaking at the same temperature, around 55 degrees C, whether at 6MHz or 10MHz, so I decided it probably wasn't that. I also probed some of the RAM chips, and it was the same situation there. 
So as this machine has 150 nanosecond RAM installed, I thought I'd go hunting for something faster, and as it happens, I had a box of old 30 pin sims and thought that these rather smart looking 100 nanosecond Gold Star branded sticks would fit the bill. Trouble is, they're one megabyte sticks and the machine refuses to boot. In fact, it turns out it's very fussy when it comes to the sims it will accept, but I did happen to have these rather rustic looking 120 nanosecond sticks that worked. That's 30 nanoseconds quicker than what was in there originally, so hopefully they'll at least prove a point. And prove a point they certainly did. Now Wolfenstein 3D is running great at 10 MHz. Success! Well, that is until I re-added the adlib card and the freeze-ups were back. So I have this theory that the extra overhead of loading the adlib music and sound effects is pushing us into that slower bank of RAM on the motherboard itself. I tried disabling this using the jumper and the command line switch for Wolf 3D to skip the memory check, but the game won't even start, which is probably to be expected. Out of interest, I tried the 24MHz crystal to run the CPU at 12MHz, but it won't even boot, even with that RAM disabled. So the situation as it stands is that we have a nice reliable 8MHz machine, an impressive 30% improvement over stock, or a somewhat reliable 10MHz machine, provided we can keep whatever we're doing in that lower, faster 512k bank of RAM. But yeah. I feel the need, the need for speed. So I've ordered some 100 nanosecond sims and matching 100 nanosecond chips for the motherboard RAM as well. Unfortunately, at the time of recording, they haven't arrived, so you'll have to join me in part three to see how I get on with those. There's also a leaked internal use only IBM BIOS for this machine that removes the speed restriction, as well as adding some other improvements. So I'm going to take a look at that as well. So I'm essentially building this into the kind of supercharged 5162 machine that IBM engineers were putting together for themselves and using internally in the late eighties. And of course, as I'm sure you've noticed, I've still got those problems with interference on the graphics side of things, which weren't solved by using a modern PSU. So there's that, as well as the tantalum caps, the overall reassembly, and everything else. But I think that's more than enough for this part. Big thanks for watching, and of course, big thanks to my patrons and channel members, whose names you see on screen as I speak, and I'll hopefully see you in part three.